Please welcome them, Mike Cobb. Good afternoon. I always hate being the first to treat everyone at lunch, so uh, hopefully I'll be making the time worthwhile for you. And, uh, hopefully not having Mariah Carey moment either. So, um, so as Roger mentioned, the transformation that's happening within the automotive and mobility industry is really amazing. It's not just transforming way people use cars and, and get around, but it will have longer lasting effects on a lot of the world, uh, not just roads, the infrastructure, but everything from the way that people build houses, to need garages, for instance, in the future, to the way that commercial buildings are developed, and for instance, we need parking garages there. So this whole transformation is going to be an exciting uh, venture in the next few years that we would glad to be part of. A lot of this, this interest in new mobility is being born from the development and the migration of people to the cities, particularly in, in more developing countries. So if you look at the word population is migrating to 66% of all the world population in the cities by 2050. And if you look at that globally, a lot of that migration is occurring in developed, undeveloped countries in Africa and Asia. And the solution will not be to build more and more roads, more parking garages, more parking spaces in the cities to help people get around and use their own vehicles. We think that new forms of mobility, uh, new technology in the area of, of machine learning and big data will actually help solve this problem for many cities around the world. And that's why a lot of, of companies are being funded to help solve the mobility uh, challenge for the cities and for the automotive industry. If you look at just the amount of venture funding that's been acquired by these new mobility startups, it's really amazing. And if you look at over time, in the last couple of years, that has continued to increase and accelerate uh, over the last couple of years. And as I mentioned, this is going to have a dramatic impact on OEMs, the companies that are selling cars to individuals. And it's going to allow them to take, take advantage of technology as a form to enable new mobility services. It starts with driving with car sharing, but also ultimately when autonomous vehicles arrive, it's going to allow them to migrate their offerings to be more of a service rather than an individual buyer per car model. The other aspect that's, that's driving this change in mobility is purely the cost for the end, end user. So in the last year, for instance, we've seen the cost per mile for Uber in LA drop from $1.26 to $1. That's a 25% decrease in just a matter of one year. And then there's forecasts from for instance, the CEO of Lyft saying that by the time autonomous gets here, level four autonomous driving, that cost per mile will drop down to 35 cents. So over time, the cost of owning a car and all its implications of parking and insurance, maintenance, gas, etc., is going to become less and less attractive to individuals. And mobility as a service is going to become much more economically viable and attractive. And we believe that ride sharing and car sharing on demand services will be, be crucial for enabling this migration to mobility as a service. But are these the only companies that are going to define and provide those services? In countries like China, for instance, these have become essentially a monopoly. In many cities in the United States and in Europe, Uber has become somewhat of a monopoly in providing the ability to service. And so we don't believe, though, this is the case. We think that as these companies develop these monopolies, there's going to be more opportunity for competition for them to be the incumbent and be disrupted by traditional OEM car manufacturing. And we're already witnessing that taking place. So many car companies are recognizing that they've got to start now to build a, an awareness of how to run an operation, how to provide a service, and how to build a brand with consumers. And transit agencies are also looking at this issue in solving the first mile, last mile challenge to getting more ridership in public transit transportation by solving that, that mobility issue at the last mile at the end of the beginning of your journey. And that's why we're beginning to, to invest in mobility services. 
So we think the time that is now for power companies to act and to start building this competency within their organizations. It's a very challenging shift to go from being a manufacturer and essentially outsourcing all your service to dealerships uh, to actually becoming a service organization, an operational organization uh, to run some of these services. We also think that the future mobility will be multidimensional. And what we mean by multidimensional is the ability to leverage the same fleet to operate multiple services across that fleet. So if you look at what we're doing today with one OEM, for instance, they're running a car sharing service, a free floating car sharing service in cities, as well as a ride hailing service. So a consumer then has one app that allows them to make that choice based on their use case, based on pricing, based on the time of day, etc. But also increase the utilization of that fleet so it can be used for multiple applications and multiple services. And it's not just about providing an app, it's about providing an end-to-end -end operating system for that service. Because it's an easy process to build an app and then broker riders and drivers or riders with vehicles. But it's a much more complex problem when you're talking about managing hundreds or thousands of vehicles in a city. Beyond just brokering those riders and drivers, you need to worry about how do I get those people authenticated? How do I check that they're valid drivers? Um, how do I automatically dispatch vehicles? And how do I predict the demand that's going to occur in a city based on usage over a period of time? Then there's the whole fleet management aspect. How do I maintain the vehicles? When do I trigger a cleaning event, for instance? So all those things are necessary to run an operation. And solving that without applying a lot of people to it in a, in a fairly autonomous way is key to running an operation efficiently. And RideSell is making this happen today. So I mentioned BMW earlier that we're working with. Um, we've helped launch them their service in a matter of months, and this is why they, they look to us and our differentiation to help them in the markets that they're serving here in North America. So we provide almost complete automation of their operation, a very small staff that operates their service. We take a true business partnership approach to working with them, uh, where we're actually co-developing the technology, and we work this way with other OEMs that we've just recently launched in, in Europe and in North, in North America. So at BMW's retail service, it's a service operating in Seattle, Portland, and Brooklyn. It offered, started out offering car sharing services. We started talking to them about five months before they launched their service. In the first month of operation, they had over 30,000 subscribers and reached a million rides within three months of operation. They then recently launched a ride hailing service. So leveraging that same fleet of vehicles that can then be used by drivers to rent for the day and then drive as they would for an Uber service, for instance. And what that does is it allows them to manage the peaks and valleys of demand for those cars because they, what they found is that car rental is often a nightly or, or weekend use case. And then car sh uh, ride sharing or ride hailing takes place at commuter times and then during the day for business purposes. So they're able to increase the utilization of that, that fleet of vehicles without adding additional vehicles to that, to that fleet. Here's an example of one of the vehicles they use, but they use multiple vehicles, i3s, BMW, um, SUVs, and uh, 330 vehicles. Another area where we're helping out transit agencies is, is an example of Southwest Transit. They're a, a regional transit transit agency up in Minnesota, and it's, they operate in a pretty large area, so it's not an urban environment, it's a suburban, rural environment, and they're running fixed routes with buses that during low peak times had one or two riders on them that had to follow a prescribed path to go from A to B to C to E. So we helped build a uh, solution for them that was a on-demand public transit service that allow them to address these low peak times with a smaller vans and allow people to go more directly to their destination and bypass the multiple stops that they do. We call this dynamic fixed routes, which is a, a, an oxymoron, but intended to be somewhat um, 
intriguing people to understand what that, what that means. So the users can actually hail a ride and bypass uh, all the intermediary stops. And if someone else comes along along that route, they the same place, the vehicle will divert, divert slightly. Is there a southwest flight? So just in the, in, the, in the last year or so that we've been operating, we've increased ridership over 600% on a daily basis without any more additional vehicles being added to their fleet, purely by managing the supply and demand process and creating these dynamic fixed routes. So that's a little bit about what we're doing and how we're helping organizations. We've got a wealth of technology and uh, experience in this space. And we look forward to working with companies here in the room and throughout the industry to help enable this new generation of mobility services. I see there's a couple of questions. So the high ground converges to autonomy and sharing ignores some barriers like vehicle condition, hygiene. Who is solving this? So it's a good question. So a lot of it is about operational practices and best practices when it comes to determining, you know, how do you, how often do you clean a vehicle? Um, when you rent a vehicle at Hertz or Avis, you know, it's typically cleaned every, or expected at least, every time you turn in the car. When there's no one involved in that process, how do you do that? So, for instance, part of our app allows you to report on the status of the vehicle when you get into the vehicle and when you leave. So if you've caused some damage, if you've created, you know, spilled your coffee or something like that, you can report it, or if the vehicle's not clean. And then that can create a ticket, which is then sent to a number of firms which operate essentially like valet services. They actually go out to the vehicle, pick it up, either clean it in its position or take it to a place to be cleaned. But this is, again, one of the issues that have to be addressed in running an, op an operation like this that you don't have to worry about. You're just building cars and, and selling them. Um, but the bottom line is there are services and there are companies that that serve that purpose. Um, and then part of it is the automation of that process so that the individual driver or user can actually report on the status of the vehicle. So the next question is, if it's that easy to launch a service, what would be the competitive differentiation among the Ubers and the OEMs? That's another great question. So clearly, just like there are airlines that offer a differentiation in their service, we'll be, we believe there will be a similar differentiation among mobility service providers. Based on the type of vehicle, there'll be differences in pricing, uh, there'll be differences in loyalty and ownership. Um, there'll be opportunities for companies to build allegiances across geographies. So just like you have the Star Alliance for multiple airlines, there will be potentially similar arrangement for car sharing and ride sharing services so that I can use essentially the same app and my authentication with ReachNow in the United States and use the DriveNow service in Europe or something else in Singapore. Um, so there'll be a number of ways that companies will differentiate their offering. And it's not just about the way the app will work, it'll be about the type of service, the type of vehicles uh, that are offered to those consumers. Um, another great question about the difference between car share and ride share once vehicles become autonomous. So many OEMs are not that interested in, in getting into the, the ride sharing business and wanting to compete with Uber right now. Particularly the economics are just not working out when you've got to go in and essentially bribe drivers to, to ride, drive your vehicles for your service. Um, it just, that's what Uber does. They come into the market. They offer drivers incentives to drive solely for them with a certain number of rides per, per month, which essentially makes it exclusive. Um, those economics just don't work out, and that's why you're losing $4 billion a year um, until they can get the driver out of the equation. But once that happens, once autonomous becomes available, um, then the consumer will have a choice whether they want to actually drive a vehicle or they want to be driven. And if that vehicle has essentially steering wheel and the, op the capability of being operated by an individual, they can essentially use the same vehicle. It could be, be driven autonomously to their house, and they could pick it up and drive it. But after they've gone out and had a few drinks, they don't want to drive it back, and they can take off in an autonomous mode and bring it back home, for instance. 
So the idea will ultimately be that you'll give the consumer the choice whether they want to participate in that process or just become a, a passenger in an autonomous service. Hopefully that, that answers the question. And then this one, next one is, what are the components of the fleet management system that are necessary to drop autonomous vehicles? So good question. So first of all, you need a mechanism of authenticating riders. You need to have their credit card um, payment you know, system or their, their method of payment in place. You need to authenticate the fact that they're not going to damage the vehicle, they've got a good reputation, for instance, just like you would as an Uber rider. But beyond that, you need things such as <clears throat> authentication of that rider in the vehicle. So that there's no human in there to say, like an Uber driver does today, are you Mike? There's now needs to be some sort of automated mechanism for allowing access. That's essentially what we do today with car sharing. So a, drive, a rider driver actually uses their app that, that authenticates them with that car and allows them into that car. The same issue will have to take place for autonomous vehicles. There have to be some means of, of recognizing that individual from their app or through some QR code or something on a vehicle that allows access. Then beyond that, there's the whole aspect of once the vehicle's um, fuel level or their battery level reaches a certain point, to be able to send that vehicle to be maintained or serviced or refueled. So that sort of automatic maintenance or dispatching and maintenance services is one necessary part of running an autonomous service. And then just the care and feeding of that vehicle over time and understanding, you know, tire wear and those types of things would be necessary as part of that fleet management operation. But a critical component is actually balancing supply and demand. So over time you, you build a profile of usage and demand from your service area. And you begin to see patterns of where vehicles need to be in order to, throughout the day in order to service that demand. Or in the anticipation of events. So if there's a football game happening and it's, you know it's getting out at 3 o'clock, there's going to be a lot of demand for autonomous vehicles. So being able to predict events, not just in the future, but also you know, based on past experience, is a key component, for instance, of the platform that we offer. So the vehicles can be moved to where they're going to be needed in anticipation of that demand. And the last question, um, as the use cases for car sharing are more limited than ride hailing, what are the benefits of starting investing in a car sharing service at this point? That's really a great question. Um, so if you think in five years that no one's going to need to rent a car anymore, that it's all going to be autonomous ride hailing, why bother to build a fleet and you know, build awareness and build that operational experience? Well, that's exactly why you should, because if you start from scratch with a um, autonomous level 4 driving is available in vehicles, you're going to be competing with a whole range of companies that have already established a brand identity, that have already understood the operational challenges and issues, and we believe that for the time is now to start building up that experience so that when autonomous vehicles are available and that transition occurs from being a purely a manufacturer to being a service provider, you will accomplish and understand how to operate and run the service. If there's any other questions, we'll be here, um, here all day and uh, happy to entertain any questions uh, after the session here throughout the day. Thanks very much for your attention.